This is the first of two videos discussing section 5.5. In this video, I'll be talking about the substitution rule. So to talk about the substitution rule, we have to remember the chain rule, which is one of the rules that we had for derivatives. And the way that we use the chain rule is when we had a function inside a function. And the way that we typically thought about this is when we had f of g of x, we're thinking of that as f of u. And so the derivative is f prime of u, that's this part here, multiplied by u prime. So when I look at a function like y equals cosine of x cubed, that inside function, the way that I'm thinking about this, is that y equals the cosine of u. So rather than x cubed on the inside there, I'm calling that u. So u is x cubed. u is that inside function. So the derivative, the y prime, is going to be the derivative of the outside function. So that would be minus the sine of u multiplied by u prime which if I put back in what u was, would give me minus the sine of x cubed. So that inside function gets left alone, but then I multiply by the derivative of that inside function. So negative sine of x cubed times 3x squared. Now, if we want to think of that chain rule as helping us figure out antiderivatives, we have to think about how we would reverse that process. So we would have to somehow be able to tell that if we wanted the antiderivative of minus sine of x cubed times 3x squared, that somehow we can kind of package that all back together and recover the original function cosine of x cubed plus c, of course, because we're taking an antiderivative. So the tricky part is trying to figure out exactly how that happened, to work backwards to figure out how the chain rule was used, um, even when we haven't just done that derivative problem. This one was pretty easy because we just did that derivative so we could tell what the antiderivative would be. But in general, we're just going to be given the antiderivative problem, and we're not going to know what that original function was. So again, looking at the chain rule, if we think of the outside function as being a capital F, so as being an antiderivative of little f, then when I take the derivative of the outside function, this little f here, that's capital F prime, and the g of x and the g prime of x, again, I can think of those in terms of u. So what the integral rule is going to tell me is that if I happen to have something that looks like f of u times u prime, I can think of that as being something that's related to the chain rule. And this is exactly what the substitution rule says. So the substitution rule, we can think of it as being the reverse of the chain rule. And what the substitution rule says is that if you have f of u multiplied by u prime times dx, which is also sometimes what we call du. So du here is u prime multiplied by dx. It's just sort of a shorthand for that. Then when we take that antiderivative, we get our original antiderivative function capital F. And then if we go back to our original variable, we get capital F of g of x plus c. So let's see how we can put that into action here. So as usual, we want u to be the inside function here. So when we look at this function here, uh, 2 times 2x plus 1 to the fifth power, there's a lot going on there, but the inside function, my u, is going to be 2x plus 1. Now to make the substitution rule work, I not only have to identify u, I have to have u prime next to my dx. So I need to figure out what u prime is. Well, the derivative of 2x plus 1 is 2, and the way we're typically going to write that is we're going to write this as du equals u prime times dx. So what this tells me is that my goal is to get a 2 next to my dx. That's going to be something that I'm going to need to do to make this substitution, this reverse chain rule, work. So fortunately, I have a 2 in my problem. It's just in the wrong place. So if I reverse the order of my multiplication, I can rewrite this integral as 2x plus 1 to the fifth times 2 dx. Now 2 dx, that's du from this equation over here. And then 2x plus 1 to the fifth, that's u to the fifth, because u is 2x plus 1. So that means I can rewrite this integral as an easier, a simpler integral, namely just the antiderivative of u to the fifth with respect to u. Now I can use my power rule and all the antiderivative rules that we've come up with to realize that that's going to be 1 sixth u to the sixth, or in other words, 1 sixth times 2x plus 1 to the sixth power plus c. So there's my antiderivative. 
Keep in mind that if we didn't have this extra two floating around, this wouldn't have worked, or at least it wouldn't have worked in the way that I did it. So this extra two is gonna become important, and we're gonna be thinking about things like that as we go forward and do more examples. Okay, let's do another example here. All right, again, lots of stuff going on in this function. We've got a secant squared of 4x cubed times 12x squared dx. So the idea is that u should be the inside function. So the inside function here is gonna be the 4x cubed. So that's what's on the inside of all this stuff. There's a lot of, there's a secant, there's lots of squaring, there's other x's, but the inside function that I'm seeing here looks like 4x cubed. So my du is going to be the derivative of 4x cubed, which is 12x squared, multiplied by dx. And so what we say to ourselves is, gosh, I really wish I had a 12x squared next to my dx. But good news, I have exactly that. I have a 12x squared next to my dx. So 12x squared dx becomes du. We can simplify now secant squared of 4x cubed. 4x cubed is u, so this is secant squared of u du. So my new integral, and the idea is that when you do this, the new integral you get should be easier than the integral that you started with, and this one is, the secant squared of u. And we know that secant squared is the derivative of tangent, so this is the tangent of u plus c. Or in other words, the tangent of 4x cubed plus c. And again, if we hadn't had this 12x squared over there in my integral, this problem might have worked out very differently. But the good news for us is that we had that 12x squared there to make this substitution work. So here's the idea, the outline for these simple substitution problems. And I'm putting the word simple in quotation marks here because these are somewhat complicated problems, but there are other kinds of substitutions and other ways that this stuff can get more complicated. So we call these simple substitutions to sort of contrast those to these more complicated ones that we'll talk about later. So the first step is to identify that inside function. If you could look back at those couple examples we did, that's the first thing that we did was figure out what's that inside function, what is that u? And then what you do is you figure out u prime and you try to work to write a u prime next to your dx. In example one, all we had to do was reverse the order of our integration of our multiplication. In example two, we didn't have to do anything. The u prime was already there. So sometimes we'll have to do things or, or and we'll, again, we'll see more examples of what are the different things that we have to do, but that's our next step in the process. Once we've got our u prime next to our dx, we're gonna rewrite the integral in terms of u and du. There should be no x's left over after this step. If you've got x's and u's mixed together in an integral, that's not going to work. So you got to make sure that all of your u's become x's. And again, we're going to see some examples of, of when that goes wrong in the next video. And then in step number four, once we've gotten our new simpler u integral, we're going to figure out that integral. We're going to evaluate it. And then finally, in step five, we rewrite the result back in terms of the original variable, x. So follow this outline. The first few examples we're going to look through are going to be relatively simple, and then we'll get into more complicated stuff in the next video.